tue, on tue, on tue, on tue. There we go. We're on. Okay, we're live. Let's see how the stream's looking. It seems to be in good condition. So, let's do this. Hey everybody, and welcome to the live stream. Stroke podcast thing. Uh, or podcast stroke live stream thing. Oh, give me a sec. So, how are you all? Hope you're well. Um, everything's fine here. Um, just uh, another day in Northern Ireland politics. Another week where everything moves so quickly. Remember, I don't know if you remember, I was saying last week when I was doing the podcast, because last, I couldn't do it last Wednesday, I did it last Thursday. And while I was doing it, there was a danger that it was going to be out of date before it finished. Not quite. It was an hour later, one hour later, it was out of date. So it wasn't just as bad as I had first envisaged, but <laughs> not much. And what happened, of course, Edwin Poots had to resign. Wow, when no one saw that coming, except we all did, because he was in he literally in a meeting. Um, and uh, in the meeting, there was going to be a vote of no conf- no confidence in Edwin, and it was it was it was predestined. He knew going in. Well, everybody knew going in that he wasn't going to survive and that's fair enough Morris McElwain oh Morris McElwain's on the YouTubes what about you brother hope you're well Um, so that's where we were last week this one isn't going to be the same Jeffrey Donaldson has a he's a much much more solid footing and should have been the nominee or should have been the the person uh, elected the first time I think not that it matters, but I don't think I don't think it's going to matter too much because, and I'll explain why. But we'll get to that. So, where are we? What have I done? Explain what I've in the past week. Um, just out of the lock, I was in the lock. I was in Loch Ness swimming, like at four o'clock with my bro. So me and my brother go swimming in the lock with a few others, but it was just me and him today. It was lovely. So we go down to Oxford Island, and at um, the Discovery Centre at the end of the peninsula, the the nature reserve that it is, the end of it. There's the the Discovery Centre, and we went for a little, went for a swim. We swam about a mile out through a couple of bu- buoys, uh, buoys, and then we stopped out there. Sort of, y- you drag, you have these drag floats, and you you have that strapped around your waist and you swim out and uh, and um, we got out there and we just sort of stopped and floated and it was r- it's rainy at them you know it's it's not a, it's not a particularly nice day de- uh, nice day it's a bit misery but we're just out there floating in the middle of the lock here in the water the rain tippy tappy on the water it wasn't heavy rain it was just mizzle but it was beautiful, really beautiful. Seen cormorants in the distance and doing a bit of fishing. Wood fishing actually. They were doing. They were sort of. I think they were sort of contemplating their navels and the nature of the universe, such as uh, as it is. But uh, yeah, it was beautiful. That was good. And the reason we did that, we, we do that on a Saturday morning as well. So we did that on Saturday. But the reason we did that today was because last night we got. 
roped into by our pal Richie McGee, who works does a lot of work down there at Oxford Sunnyside Football Club, to sign it up for the over thirty fives. And um, we're I can assure you, I am well over the thirty five mark. But we went down, and we basically played played the first game of competitive football in. It's got to be. 10 or 15 years anyway, maybe more. And our bones, our old war wounds, my knee. Whoo! I had to go and buy one of them support straps. Because <laughs> I do a lot of sport, but I don't do that sort of football which is stop, start, stop, start. And it's very demanding on the joints. That, you know, f- field sports, team sports like that. Football and guild football and hurling and and, and think rugby. Even, but it has its, its own physical challenges, of course. But football's like that, and if you're not used to that, it takes its toll on you. And as I said, we haven't done that. So we do a lot of sport. We do a lot of cycling and swimming and running and all this sort of thing. But that nature of football, we don't do that, so it takes a toll on you. And it, it, it's it's not the end of the world, but, you know, it is what it is. So I uh, felt a wee bit, uh today. So what do you do? Best thing in the world, go for a swim in the lock. Right? Because it's great for that. And it, and it is great for that. So that's why we went for the swim in the lock. So there you go. Plus, we wanted to. So we're we're um, we're getting ready for triathlons and duathlons and all this sort of stuff. So, But there you go. So, on to the, the business at hand. So, I want to talk to you. Well, I want to talk to you. I don't... We're going to talk about DUP. Obviously, the DUP is the hot topic in Northern Ireland. Right? And I wish they weren't. I wish we could... I wish it was boring. As I've said... You've heard me say this before. I wish it was boring politics. I wish it was dull. That So dull that they didn't, that they didn't have to talk about it. But, unfortunately, it's not. And... I... Th- the reason I started this podcast, this this live stream, is as I was I was explaining to someone during the week, and I'll get on to actually. You know what? I'm going to get on to that first, but just after this, I was explaining that the reason that I started this, I cards on table, right? I don't want to do this. I don't. I don't want the. I don't want to do this. I've got better things to do with my time. I don't, I'm not very comfortable doing this. But I've committed to do it and I'm going to finish it. And what I want to do is I'm advocating for United Ireland. That's what this is about. Right? And I don't want to spend all my time slagging off the, the DUP. But they don't make it easy. Okay? And... They are so comically out there that they are a very easy target. In the best of times, in times like these, when they're going through these tumultuous fluxes and ebbs and flows, to use an a, a nautical aquatic term, it's even easier. But I would rather talk about I would rather, what I want to talk about is, as I said, is a United Ireland. I want to talk about the positives of a United Ireland and the negatives. And there's going to be things, we're going to have to work at things. And we, a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of give and a bit of take and a bit of movement and a bit everyone's going to have, you know, and that's what I want to talk about. And if you go back and listen to my earlier podcast, that's what I was talking about that mostly. And it's only more recently that it's become it's not focused on the DUB it's just that they keep doing so much it's so that has to be commented on and if I'm talking about politics in Northern Ireland I'm not talking about the DUP it, that's kind of you know that's the the nuclear bomb to, actually that's a very bad analogy but that's the big thing that's happening right so I don't want to talk about them all the time but I was talking last week again about a lot about what was going on with the DUP and 
someone sent me a message on Instagram, and I'm not going to tell you who they are. But I'm going to read their message. Not the vast to remain anonymous. And if I did ask, but I wasn't clear in the response. I wasn't sure. She's, the person said, yeah, that's okay. But I wasn't sure if she, they meant to remain anonymous or not. But I wouldn't imagine they did. But in order for me not to make a mistake, I've decided to keep the person anonymous. And they sent me this message from last week. And... I'm going to read it to you, and it says, just listening to your recent podcast, and I've redacted the next sentence, just in case. Exactly what I think about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Why do unionists, why do unionists not see that embracing it would actually stave off a United Ireland? That was the point I was making last week, right? It's actually incredible. All the undecideds would want to stay in the UK if they were making more pounds and had more opportunities. Right? Let's be honest. Electoral politics has fought over the middle ground. It's fought over the undecideds. I want the United Ireland. I know what way I'm voting coming a border poll. You may not want the United you may decide to stay. So therefore we're not we're not going to be swayed. It's that middle ground. It's those people that can go one way or the other. Right? That's where the battle is going to be fought. And what the person here is saying, I'll call um this person, S, let's say S. Um, all the undecideds would want to stay in the UK, and if they were making more pounds and had more opportunities, and had more opportunities. This wrecked my head, but then I realised that having a divided and scared electorate will keep them in jobs, the politicians, and having people believe that we are shit and need the UK. Right? This is important. This goes back to colonialism and colonial thinking. A dominated per cult culture thinking of that they that they why should, why are we uniquely the only people on earth that can't rule themselves? Right? That's not an accident. That's by design. So S goes on uh, d- 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 that we need the UK for handouts and can't go it alone means people won't take the risk on a UI. It amazes me that they don't realise that making the most of the Northern Ireland Protocol would actually make us more valuable to the UK. Bonker shit. And here's the thing, right? S finishes with this. As much as I want a UI, in the meantime, until then, I also want to see people here do well and have opportunities. And if that's in the UK, then so be it. Right? Now, I think that that uh, opinion is very common in the north of Ireland among nationalists as as well as unionists but among nationalists. I think that that so for someone that wants a united Ireland what they want is prosperity first and then the United Ireland can come behind it, maybe eventually, right? And that's where we've been. But this is where we are. Current unionism won't allow it. Unionism will choose to eat crow, to use an old expression, which means to to be second class, to eat shit, rather than do well, and be seen to be one step removed, but is what they claim the, the the Northern Ireland Protocol does for them. One step removed from the the motherland of England, right? So, so what I would say in response, and we, we did talk, and we, I completely agree, she's, she's absolutely right, Um. We live in a colonised society. Unionism is an expression of colonisation. We were colonised. England, or Ireland was England's first colony. And 
I was listening to a fantastic podcast this week, and you have to listen. If, I'm going to recommend this strongly. Please go and listen to this. It's the Irish. It's called the Irish Passport. I re- I recommend this regularly, and the the fantastic journalist uh, Naomi O'Leary, uh, and her podcast partner Tim, who she's a journalist for the Irish. She, she's a European correspondent for the Irish Times, and I think he's a history teacher. Uh, residing in Paris, both they're both Irish, but they're in Europe doing their thing, and they did this podcast, and the, the, the whole Irish passport series is absolutely fantastic. But the last issue that they did was about the colony, the common links between the colonized countries of India and Ireland, and the old the old British Empire. It is fucking fabulous. You have to go and you have to listen to this. So the Irish passport, you listen to podcasts, listen to that last one. Explains the commonality. What was going on in 1916 and the rise and Indian law students and then those Indian law students get inspired and they go back and you know, in the 1940s and India gets its independence, etc., etc. So, but they explain why Ireland and India were particularly special to the Union. Sorry, to the Empire, because as much as you, as much as Unionists would tell us that this is a, this is a union of equals, it is not. We are a colony. We were a colony. The Act of Union in 1800 was supposed to give Irish natives and Catholics equal rights. and or, Well, not as much as... No, there was no such thing as equal rights unless you were a landowner, unless you were you were so, uh, wealthy and the gentry. But voting rights in, in Westminster, the king put an end to that. The, 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 the Act went to the king to be signed. Parliament signed off on it. They went to the king. The king went, no. And that was it, 1800. So the, the, the parliament in Dublin, which was advocating for home rule, got dissolved in order to get voting rights in Westminster. The parliament got dissolved first, goes to Westminster, the king stymies the whole thing. So this is not a... We are a colony. This is not a... And the reason, by the way, that that all happened was because before that you had the American Revolution and you had the French Revolution. So revolution was in the air. And the empire was afraid... That that was going to happen here, and it did, and they were right too, because it was con- it was constant revolutions, and um, the big ones obviously were seventeen ninety eight, the United Irishmen, and etc. And then obviously the there was, but every few every decade there was a there was a, an uprising of some sort. So this is not a union of equals. We are a colony, and that colonial mindset still exists, and. I'm, I was going to bring this in at some point, and now seems a very good point. Sammy Wilson was in... I'm, I, th- I want to thank S for sending me that very thoughtful uh, message. Uh, if anyone else wants to send me messages and, and c- comment and quote and whatever, please do. So, talking about colonial, mi- colonial mindsets, the DUP are, in, in a lot of ways... And unionism, I would say in general, are the 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 natural offshoot of the colonial mindset, right? And I found it very funny that this very week, Sammy Wilson was in the House of Commons, and this is what he said. Let's check this out. The kind of condescending, patronising attitude that we get from the chairman of the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Select Committee doesn't go down very well in in Northern Ireland. This kind of condescending attitude. If the natives can't get it together, then let's do it here. It's like he was talking like some 19th century colonial ruler. Colonial something, uh, Lord, I think it was the end of the sentence. That's bizarre. Check it out again. We'll play it again. It's only a few seconds. The kind of condescending, patronising attitude oh. that we get from the chairman of the... A Northern member of the Affairs DUP... Say, Accusing someone else of being condescending and patronising. Are you fucking joking? Fuck off, Sammy. ...committee doesn't go down very well in, in Northern Ireland. This kind of condescending attitude, if the natives can't get it together, then let's do it here. It's like he was talking like some 19th century colonial ruler. <laughs> colonial git. I'm sure that wasn't the end of the sentence, but that's where I'm going. I'm going to, 
I'm going to paraphrase the end of that for Sammy. You're welcome, Sammy. Some 19th century colonial git. There we go, right? So, and I find that I find that on Reddit. It's another social media thing that I patronize. And some of the comments under it are fantastic. Uh, so Reddit's like a message board. So Jibface, username, I don't know who it is, says, This is genuinely baffling. I've long stopped expecting consistent consistency or sense from the DUP, but these are literally nationalist talking points. <laughs> It's it's so fucking true. It's really, really true. It, that if Sinn Féin were in the House of Commons, that's the sort of stuff they would say. And I should say this as well. When they're what Sammy Wilson's there saying, the people of North and and you hear this a lot, right? The people of Northern Ireland, the DUP behave they talk about the people of Northern Ireland like they're representing the entire country just on their own and there's no other voice. They're a fucking minority of a minority. They don't represent they represent if there was an election held tomorrow, they're going to get creamed. So they do literally represent a minority of a minority. So for them to say the people of Northern Ireland, which is what they're running around saying, it's a fucking laugh. And one of the things that gets on my tits at the minute, I'm watching so much stuff about what's going on. And I love getting caught up on what the English media are saying about us here. I don't listen to what we say about us here. I don't listen to Stephen Nolan or I don't because I, I don't need to know what Jim Allister says or Sammy Wilson or Jamie fucking Binman Bryson. I don't need to know. I could because I do know, but I'm kind of very interested in what it goes on in England or, or what they say about us in England and further afield. And I did show you Sarah McKay from an interview on France 24 last week where she said about this idea that Northern Ireland is, is on fire or ready to go back to the bad old days is is a complete nonsense. It's complete nonsense. So, but the DUP are trying to... St- they are literally trying to stoke this into a fire, but there isn't the energy behind it. There isn't the real energy. The riots peter out. They they kick off and they, they're horrible as they are. They don't last long. They go nowhere. The numbers turning up at the protests are minuscule. There was supposed to be 4,000 in Portadown two weeks ago. There was 800 turned up, including the families. How many of those were travelling support, I don't know. Then there was supposed to be another big one last week in Newton Arts. And the speakers at it was Jamie Bryson, Kate Hoy, Ben Habib, the arch Brexiteer, and uh, Jim Allister. So these are four big anti-Northern Ireland Protocol pro-Brexit voices within loyalism, although Ben Abu isn't a loyalist. Uh, I don't know if Jim Allister would say he was a loyalist. He probably does. Um, and it was a handful of people. Well, it was a few hundred people. It wasn't a thousand anyway. In Newton Ards. And again, how many of those were travelling support? And Portadown and Newton... If you can't gather a loyalist crowd in places like Portadown and Newton Ards... You, you know, Jim, and then Jimmy Bryson is talking about going down to Dublin to protest down in Dublin. <laughs> with with uh, To quote his words exactly, with large numbers. You can't get large numbers in fucking Portadown, mate. You're not going to get large numbers in Dublin. And just on that, he should be allowed to go. People are saying, oh, fucking stop him. No, let him go. And don't let anyone fucking attack them. They want to protest, let them protest. But the funniest fucking thing you've seen in the ages, but but definitely do not. And they'll mo- he, he's an arch moaner and complainer and serial grievance finder and just ugh, let them get on with it. But as I said, um, this comment I'm about to read you about the Sammy Wilson uh, video there was under the post and it was from. Another, it was a UK, well, yeah, it was a UK um, uh, commenter. Hey, let me say. Oh, just before I do, I'm going to read out a few of the live chats. So, Morris McElwain, doing okay, brother. 
Love to the family. Coffee is going downhill. Yes, my wife has left her job and I'll go in a coffee shop and pour it out. So, Morris, sorry, nothing I can do about that. I must say, though, the coffee at home is fantastic. <laughs> uh, Barry Ellis, only 31 now, but need a good 20 minutes stretching before and after playing football, so I'm not in, in bits afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I oh, believe you. Oh, I stretch. Don't you worry about that. I have to stretch. <laughs> it's, I spend so much of my day stretching. Lee Bruner, howdy from old Kentuck. Oh, Lee, how you doing, brother? Oh, oh, I'd love the gig again. Mick Conlon. Mick Conlon. Catch me up. DUP still as functional as my granddad's prostate. <laughs> yep, that's about the height of it. Um, right, so... This UK commenter mentions on it's 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 a sort of a two or three paragraph post, but I do find it interesting. So here we go. I'll pile through this. <clears throat> I think it's an interesting parallel with the British colony of Rhodesia's unpopular sovereignty. That was in inverted commas. The white settler minority unilaterally declared independence from Britain after the British government refused to grant it independence unless it introduced majority rule. The colonial minority, adopting the political behaviour and language of anti-colonialism in order to effectively uphold the colonial institutions. So you see what he's trying to say here? Sam, Sammy Wilson going into the House of Commons and complaining about the House of Commons. While, you know, unionism are the agents of colonialization colonial colonial the colonialization of ireland and the partition of ireland was done purely well the partition of, of of ireland was done purely to keep the tory party in power who are we reminded of um lord carson what a fool was i I was only a puppet, and so was Ulster, and so was Ireland, in the political game that was to get the Conservative Party into power. I would care. Right? That's what unionism is for. For the Tory party. That's it. They don't give a shit. How many times do you read in the British papers that, that, that you know they're prepared to sacrifice Northern Ireland in order to see Brexit through? And that, by the way, that um, opinion holds strong, as strong today as it did two or three years ago when it was first became sort of known in the mainland that mainland in inverted commas again you know um, in the mainland that the Irish border issue was going to be an issue for Brexit and that still holds today so I'll push on with this guy's comment so we're talking about Rhodesia um, formerly Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Ulster unionism isn't quite as broken as a national idea as Rhodesia's was, but I can't help see parallels which are quite stark. When you see something like this, and I think the colonial mentality does explain the actions of the DUP, people always say the DUP are stupid, that they can't see the inevitable consequences of their actions. I think we need to confront the idea that they simply don't care. Their self-destructive destructive ad- advocacy of Brexit was because they could not bear to make common cause with nationalist remainers. I would say nationalists, not remainers. But that's that's another another pylon for them. Because nationalists are, to their view, deeply beneath them. I don't think political unionism makes bad choices per se. It's more that to them there are no choices. Cooperating with Demons is simply not an option, in the same way that the Rhodesians simply refused to countenance legal equality with a native black majority, and so ended up losing control of the whole process anyway, as unionism did. I also think that this is why the attitude to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a more which is a more which is a more creative unionism which which a more sorry, excuse me. Their attitude to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which a more creative unionism could use to secure Northern Ireland's place in the UK, not weaken it, is so entrenched to exploit the opportunities the Protocol offers, political unionism would have to admit that Demons were right. Right? So, we're not 
I'm not saying I agree with every word of what this dude's saying here, but he's fucking not far off it. But this is the important bit. I'll read that again. I also think that this is why the attitude to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which a more creative unionism could use to secure Northern Ireland's place in the UK, not weaken it, is so entrenched. To exploit the opportunities the protocol offers, political unionism would have to admit Demons were right. And that's it in a nutshell. That's it in a nutshell. Look at what's going on with the fucking Irish Language Act. This is not about the Irish Language Act. This is about equality. And one of the things I will say this, I'm hearing, <coughs> excuse me, Colin Eastwood and other SDLP, and I'm not going, I'm not getting into a nationalist fucking tit for tat bit, bitch fight or whatever it is, but going on, Sinn Féin dug their heels in over the Irish, Lang- Act, the Irish Language Act, and they did. But for... For to, f- for to deliberately fail to understand that this is not a, just about the Irish Language Act, is it di- is, is, is a disservice? It's, dis- it's disingenuous, I, I do believe. I genuinely do believe that. And I heard him making a speech in the House of Commons going on about, you know, he making a, a parallel between the two parties making a fight out of the, the, the Irish Language It's not two parties. It's one party. It's the DUP. This was agreed years ago. This was agreed 10 years ago, I believe, maybe more. That these language acts would 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 pass and this and they have and it's the DUP that's held them up. The DUP are determined to not make Stormont work. They they don't turn up at meetings, they, they do turn up at north south things, they don't turn up at north south things. They keep quoting scheduling conflicts as a reason that this minister can't go to that or that minister can't go to that. So the Sinn Féin sidestepped them and went directly to the, the to the to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Brandon Lewis. Fair play to them, I say. I think they did brilliantly. But there we go. So on with what this dude says. So I say this is him, not me. I say political unionism because I don't think this is how the vast majority from a unionist background see the world. He says political unionism, not you, people from a unionist background. He's He's making a very clear distinction between the two things, right? Um, which I think is becoming increasingly clear in the growth of a Northern Irish identity and the Alliance Party now that there is... N- uh, and the Alliance Party now that there is no provisional IRA campaign and political unionism can invoke... Sorry, I have mangled this. And I'm, going to read, I'm going to read this paragraph again. I say political unionism. Because I don't think this is how the vast majority of people from a unionist background see the world. Which I think is becoming increasingly clear in the growth of a Northern Irish identity. And the Alliance Party now that there is no provisional IRA campaign that political unionism can invoke to discipline its people. Recall James Molyneux, the worst thing to ever happen to us was Sinn Féin entering government and that hasn't caused the sky to fall in. Okay. I think the DUP's future is ultimately to be pulled apart, one might say partitioned, between the UUP alliance faction and the more moderate people with ageing hardliners going to the TUV. I think in a very unlikely event Northern Ireland sees its 200th birthday, it will be despite political unionism and not because of it. Completely right. The two great ironies of Rhodesia were, firstly, that it touted its supposed contribution to the British defence in world wars as a reason why the British had betrayed Rhodesia by not allowing it to become an independent apartheid state. Despite the fact that without British guns, British soldiers, it would never have existed. Secondly, that the Rhodesians considered themselves an outpost of British civilization and culture in Africa, whilst being totally left behind by what the British culture actually has was to, was to become by 1965. You had the 60s, the Beatles, the Stones, Perfumo Affair, Lady Chatterley's Lover, etc. in the mother country, whilst a bunch of golf club bores and Colonel Blimp types were doing a Victorian LARP in Central Africa. 
Bravo. That's fucking it. That is it. And that for me, that's that's just it summed up. That parallel. We're not Rhodesia, obviously, but there are parallels there, and the common thread that links that makes the parallels is colonization. So we'll move on. So, um, as you know, let me just see here first. Right, so, as you know, Jeffrey Donaldson has been, is now the leader of the DUP, which is great for them. I hope it works, because if it works for him, it works for us all. Who's Jeffrey Donaldson? Jeffrey Donaldson is the MP for Lagan Valley. Very, very strong unionist majority. Um, now, here's one I didn't know. I did know, but I forgot. From 1982 to 1984, he was a constituency agent for the Ulster Unionist MP, Enoch Powell. Enoch Powell, Powell was the Rivers of Blood speech guy that warned about uh, immigration into especially coloured coloured exactly coloured coloured people's immigration, so black people from the West Indies and um, um, Indian people from uh, India. And they warned about the rivers of blood. That's what he was. And he got a b- sort of ended his career. It didn't end his career. Because he, he carried on for a long time. But so Jeffrey Donaldson. He, he started out political life. He started out in the UUP. Fell out with them. Because of the peace process. And the, the Good Friday Agreement. He was against the Good Friday Agreement. And went to the. He's been in the DUP ever since. Was it? 2004. No. So it was himself, Arlene Foster, and Nora Burr, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that, announced their resignation from the UUP, 2003, and joined the DUP. So, I'm going to read an article here from Brian Feeney. And Brian Feeney says, If unionists can't live on equal terms, then it's over for Stormont. And we must remember that one of the one of the things the the machinations that of the, the the one of the desired outcomes let me put it that way one of the desired outcomes of uh all the sorry i'm just cleaning my screen up there one of the desired outcomes of all the the recent goings on in the DUP was to cause the collapse of Stormont. That was a, po- a possible, as they saw a possible out. But they wanted the sh- they wanted Sinn Fein to do it over the Irish Language Act. They keep agreeing to introduce it, and then they delay and delay. And you can't you can't say that the Irish language community haven't been patient. They've been more than patient, more than patient. But it's become quite clear that it was the DUP holding their whip hand in storm it we're never going to do it so they sort of set the stack the deck to make it most likely that it would be Sinn Féin again that collapses Stormont but they didn't they as I said sidestepped Stormont went straight to the Secretary of State he introduced the Irish Language Act through Westminster and it's going to be brought in in August, and it's not a full Irish language act. It's it's a very diluted version of what sh- what it should be, but it's a first step. So there's an article here by Brian Feeney, who is fantastic. And this is what he says: There are buckets of ink being wasted on wondering whether Sir Geoffrey Donaldson is a moderate in the DUP, or even more laughably, on the non-existent moderate wing of the DUP. <laughs> I, love, I do find it fucking hilarious that Arlene Foster is being 
is being reimagined as some sort of a moderate now. She's been, she was actually all right, you know, compared to Edmund Boots, probably. Still Arlene Foster. She still believes in what she believes in. She still behaves the way she behaves. I think she's still, I think she's sectarian. I think they hide their sectarianism quite well. As I said before, a few weeks before she resigned, she, she was interviewed and she said that she thinks that even if uh, Sinn Féin get returned as the first party in, a, in an election, that there should still be a unionist first minister. Well, that's just sectarianism. That's not the, that's not democracy. That's just blatant sectarianism. But no one called her out on that. And it took me, it, it, it took me aback. I was like, that you, how, how is she getting away with this? But she did. It was never brought up. Except by me. So, onwards with the article. In fact, Donaldson's record shows he's been remarkably consistently an old-style hardline unionist. Like the DUP as a whole, Donaldson opposed the Good Friday Agreement. He walked out on Trimble at a crucial point in the final negotiations. He then spent the next five years leading the anti-Good Friday Agreement faction in the UUP undermining Trimble through an endless series of meetings of the Ulster Unionist Council. After repeatedly failing either to get rid of Trimble or defeat him at those meetings, Donaldson finally left the UUP and joined the DUP in 2004. The DUP never signed up to the Good Friday Agreement, but preferred to attach the fig leaf of the St Andrews Agreement to enable him to get into the Stormont Executive. Donaldson's opposition to the terms and consequences of the Good Friday Agreement, like the rest of the DUP, has never changed. So Brexit offered what appeared to be an unforeseen opportunity to negate some of those consequences. One of the most offensive being an open British border in Ireland. Right. That was back then. Donaldson was insistently one of the most enthusiastic Brexiteers. He spent 2016 to 19 arguing ceaselessly for a deal which would inevitably inevitably produce a hard border. And again, I keep talking about, keep mentioning this when I get an opportunity. Don't forget that this was the DUP's end game, was a hard border in Ireland. This is what they wanted. Jeffrey Donaldson said that he was 40,000 job losses if Brexit happens in Northern Ireland. He said that's a, that's a number that I'm I'm comfortable with. Not his job, by the way. Your job. My job. I don't have a job. Your job. My job may not exist anymore. But, onwards. So, he made countless media appearances talking nonsense about the magical technical apparatus for detecting the contents of lorries crossing the border. Remember that? Apparatus with apparatus which exists nowhere in the world, nor could it. All Donaldson and the DUP could see was that if there was a hard Brexit, then there would, how would there be a hard British border in Ireland? How that was to be placed was neither here nor there. So determined was Donaldson to achieve this goal that he didn't care about the inevitable economic consequences either. Against all evidence, he routinely denied them. When confronted with an official civil service report, for, there we go, forecasting 40,000 job losses in the north, he famously responded to BBC Radio 5 that he could live with that. Nothing was as important as re-establishing the border of the 1950s. The stupidity of his positions was mind-blowing. The EU, the USA and his own British government all professed themselves determined to avoid a hard border in Ireland for economic, social, political and security reasons. Excuse me. <coughs> Why did Donaldson think this? Oh, sorry. Why did Donaldson think his nonsensical plan would prevail? Simple. His unbending, reflexive, hardline unionism. He's still at it. His current speeches against the Irish Protocol indicate his belief that he can whip up the opposition to it. The British government will finally jettison it. Unionists, great, though forlorn, hope. Unionists, I'll read that again. Unionists, great, though forlorn, hope is that if the protocol goes, then a hard border follows. Bingo. Doesn't matter what the US or the EU say, marching a few hundred suckers around Newton Ards will change everything. Right? Have they any idea how tawdry a makeshift platform with, of all people, the intellectual giant Kate Hoey on it looks? That'll take a lot of votes off, Johnson. 
Still, so important is it to Donaldson and the DUP to have the hard border that they will block the re-establishment of an executive unless the protocol is removed. Good luck with that. Acnegilaga is a motive, but secondary. This is what I've been saying. In that case, there will be an election. But so what? Our proconsul can stall an election for years. There's plenty of precedent dating far back to 2003. If and when an election is called, there's supposed to be one next year, by the way, it will be to what? An executive won't be formed because the protocol will still be operating. And if the British government keeps it, if, and if the British government keeps its promise to Sinn Féin. On the other hand, if the British cave into the DUP and renege on Acnegilaga, Sinn Féin won't nominate. It's the end game, folks. If unionists can't agree to live on equal terms, which means respecting Sinn Féin and honouring their word, then it's Sinn Féin for Stormont. And I think that's pretty much bang on, don't you? Um, I was and it, just on another thing here. Of, of uh. I'm not going to read too much of this because I don't like to read. I don't like to give people like um, Jamie Bryson too much airtime because I think he gets far too much as it is. You know, he's, as I keep saying, he's basically a rabble riser without a rabble. But. There's an article here in Belfast Live. I'm just going to read the last paragraph. And he says in it, it's the last paragraph. The next DUP leader, this is before uh, Donaldson was elected. The next DUP leader should listen to those in the streets and tune into the beat of loyalist drums. Edwin Poots was not removed because he failed to reach out to nationalism. He was removed because he compromised and wasn't hardline enough. It's time for political unionism to get in step with the beat of the drum. The loyal I, I, I paraphrase now, the loyalist drum. Edwin Poots was removed because he comprom because he compromised, because he wasn't hardline enough. This is fucking staggering. It's absolutely staggering stuff. And then there's another little thing here from uh, Sam McBride did an interview with Edwin Poots. You can see it on the screen there. It says, Edwin Poots tells Good Morning Ulster he received assurances from Brandon Lewis that there would be very significant changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which would be a significant win for Unionists. But then admits we haven't got detail of what those changes would be. I... Uh I'm 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 stunned. I'm absolutely there we go. What a fool was I. I was only a puppet and so was Ulster and so was Ireland in the political game that was to get the Conservative Party into power. Edwin Poots. This is after he's been kicked out. After he's he's lost his leadership. Edwin Poots tells Good Morning Ulster he received assurances from Brandon Lewis that there would be very significant changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol which would be a significant win for unionists, but then admits we haven't got detail of what those changes will be. Well, I'll tell you what the changes will be, Edwin. Fuck all. Fuck all. So. And then some of the comments. Underneath. There was one here from a lady called Harriet Murr Boyd. I don't know who this is. She says, It's such an owner and very unwanted pet situation. No matter how often the pet is abused, it stays loyal to its owner. It's... Uh, that's insane. The Carson quote just jumps out at you there, doesn't it? I, can't, I, I, I fucking can't believe this. That uh, even after all of this, they're still going to the Tories and going, Oh, have a bit of fucking pride, man. Have a bit of pride. My God, stand on your own two feet. It is beyond belief. It is it is fucking beyond belief. Now, and what Jeffrey Donaldson is going to bring new to this fucking situation 
is uh, is a mystery. There he is, the lovely Jeffrey. Is this hard line enough? If you haven't seen, uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast, there's a lovely picture there of Daniel O'Donnell with his top off and pair of stonewashed jeans. The slightly saucy and misleading, uh, implica- uh, implying that this is Jeffrey Donaldson. Though they do bear a certain, they do they do bear a certain resemblance, don't they? So, so this is my point. So, the, 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 this is the whole. The, this is my point of this. This podcast today. This live stream. Where are we? We're fucking nowhere again. We're going nowhere. We've done nothing. The clear path, as S says in her messages to me earlier on, and as I keep saying, the clear path to victory is through the Northern Ireland Protocol. For unionism. We can make it work. And it works for everybody. Because... So, so how does it work for nationalists? Well, nationalists get closer ties to the South, more economic ties, more actual ties, physical. You know, the the cross border trade for April has gone apparently has gone through the roof. I should have pulled that little statistic up and seen it during the week. The cross border trade for April, which is the the the, the, the latest um, the latest month for which we have the records, is sharp spike. And that's going to continue. Uh, this is a win-win. It's a win-win for everybody. But unionism can't literally start snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Now, you kind of understand to a point. You get to you, you under you can you can understand to a point where unionism won't engage w- w- with this because. It doesn't want to admit that this is a possibility. The United Ireland is a possibility, and they don't want to be seen to encourage it. I get that, but that's the ship has sailed. The UK doesn't, Britain doesn't fucking want us. It doesn't want us. It doesn't fucking want us. And you can't keep clinging to it like it does. It doesn't. It's time to flee the fucking nest. For those of us that are maybe worried about loyalists and violence and all the rest of it, I personally am or I'm not. I'm not concerned. I'm not saying that they're not capable of doing something horrible to an individual and that's it's not a price worth paying. What I am saying is that the levels of violence and mayhem that loyalism was capable of creating in the 80s and the 90s, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, it's not going to be capable of doing that in the United Ireland because it was the British state that carried them to their dastardly deeds. Johnny Adair said that, was it the UVF he was in? I can't remember. East Belfast UVF, there was 200 and... No, I can't, I can't even remember what the numbers were, but it was something like... There was... There's 270 members of us, and like 268 of them were being paid by the British security forces. They were in the direct employ of the of the security forces. So that's not going to exist. And that collusion did did happen. And it does. It, it did happen. I don't know if it's still. I don't think. I'm not sure. No, it did happen. I'm going to end my sentence there. I know what happened. I remember when Rosemary Nelson died. I remember the night. The fucking cops were all over the place. I was getting messages like, "Oh, cops are everywhere. Cops are everywhere." And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not done anything. I'm, I'm not a dude. Wasn't then, not now. Police helicopters were up in the air. They never said. All of a sudden, everything went silent. An hour later, Rosemary Nelson was dead. Then you find out the details of where the cops were, and they, they, these these guys get fucking directed to murders. That's not going to happen in the United Ireland. As I said, I'm not saying that they're not capable of random acts of violence. Anyone is. But being afraid of what they did in the past, I, no, 
I'm, 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 conv- I'm, I'm not afraid. I don't think that that's going to happen. I don't. I genuinely don't. So, yeah. And th- this is. The, I, I want to. I want to finish. I want to finish. This podcast started for me on a completely different sort of tangent. I had another idea for it, and it was. And I will go into this at some point when I get a little bit more meat on the bone of it. But it was this. I'm seeing now so-called mainstream unionist politicians talking with the LCC, the Loyalist Communities Council, and giving them cover almost. Now, the LCC, again, I do have some articles saved on this, and I will get to it, but not tonight, are... Threatening violence. They did that walk during the week when they said peace or the, no protocol or uh, protocol or peace. That was basically so they were, they're, they're, they're threatening a form of violence that was in Newt Nords. And those politicians, Kate Hoey, J- J- uh, Jim Allister, Ben Habib, he's not, I don't think he's a politician, ex MEP, and um, Jamie Bryson, definitely not a politician. That banner was in front of them. Jim Allister is a member of the TUV, an MLA T for the TUV in the Stormont Assembly, and he says he didn't see the the, ban- the banner. The banner was right there in front of him. Doug Beatty was at a, as he, he said, he was just observing, which, and I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, at a Loyalist march in Portadown, and there was men there with balaclavas on. He says he didn't see them. Now, the the combined leadership of, of unionism seems to, Need to get its fucking eyes tested, because these things were clear to see, and you y- you are definitely being. <clears throat> I think you're definitely being a wee bit dishonest, but talking with people like people like the loyalist community, LCC as the call them, says the loyalist communities council, as if they're in a, a legitimate body, as if you should talk to them. They're representatives of terrorists. And we know what these terrorists do. As I said during the week, um, if you want to know what the guy that sold your wee sister a gram of cocaine thinks about the Northern Ireland Protocol, there you go, that's your... They're fucking drug dealers. They terrorise and destroyed their own communities. The loyalist communities, communities, I mean, the word commune, communi- commune, collective, that's what, you know... There's an implication of caring, of looking after one another in that word that doesn't cannot be applied to these people. So, for these, for mainstream unionists to be giving these people cover and to be listening to them and taking heed of them, rather than just condemning them outright. Now, here's the thing: this is what this was what I, what I was going to start with. Back in the eighties and the nineties, if you voted for Sinn Fein, you were called an IRS sympathizer, and you probably you may well have been. You probably were. I did. I didn't vote for Sinn Fein back then. I well, I didn't vote back in the nineties. I never got the vote until never got my first vote until in, in sorry the eighties. Never got my first vote until the nineties. Um, if you voted for Sinn Fein back in the eighties, you would probably be called a sympathizer of the IRA because they were representatives of they were officially the political representatives of the IRA. Although it's not official, the LCC are are official representatives of loyalists who we know are just fucking drug dealers. And if you're a mainstream unionist politician, then you're not calling them out, and you then, as a normal citizen of of the north of Ireland vote unionists are you then voting for the UDA and the UVF see what I mean the connection can I say that if I said if I said if you vote for Doug Beatty or if you vote who doesn't condemn outright the LCC then you're voting for the LCC you're voting for the UDA and the UVF can I say I'm asking a question I'm just I'm positing uh, train of thought because if I vote for Sinn Féin in 1984 and you call me an IRS sympathiser which would be true and you vote for the DUP or the TUV or well I'm going to leave the UV, UUP out of it for the minute but the rest of them 
uh, and they're not condemning. In fact, platforming the LCC. Why can I not say the other thing? Why can I not say, well, let's see, if that applies to one, then that definitely applies to you too. Which it does, and it needs fucking said. And the reason that it needs said is because the DUP, again, marching them up the hill and marching them down again for, for decades, and now they're doing it again. But because it's not official, it's not official, they get away with it. They go, well, you're not representatives of the UDA. We're just concerned politicians. The fucking cards is what they are because they won't say who they're getting their orders from and they are. So I want to talk about that a bit more but I need to put a bit more meat on that bone. So we're done with that subject for now. I'm going to... We're going to move on to another subject. Real quick. Nearly done. Nearly done. We're, We're about an hour into this. So... Here we go. This is an interesting little thing. United Ireland. You're not going to talk about United Ireland again, Andrew, are you? I'm afraid I am. Yes, 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 yes. As I said, this is the reason for this fucking podcast. Which is a pain in my ass, but this is why I do it. So. This is an article from Trade Unionists for United Ireland. Now, I have a friend, uh, Rory Craney who is a member of this group, may have been one of the founders of this group. So, and the article is titled, A four-day working week must be included on the discussion of Irish unity. And the reason that I bring this up was, I'm very interested in it, but the reason that I bring it up as well, somebody asked me a while back what to do a podcast on UBI, Universal Basic Income, and I will. And this is all connected. This is all about the, the economics, modern economics, and it's an opportunity because if we're going to have a new United Ireland, a new Ireland, a United Ireland, a, a, a new different thing, we have to, we have to engage in the new economics of the planet, of of the of the the possible, of what's possible. UBI's four day working weeks, maternity leaves, paternity leaves, all these things, but and one of the reasons that we have to we have to discuss them. You say, well, who's going to pay for them? Well, the corporations obviously are going to pay for them. The the we're, we're, the people that have the fucking money is going to pay for them. There's no point in coming to the people that don't have the money, right? So, and this is one of the ways of getting them to pay for it because they're not paying their taxes. And we know this. So other, we may have to come at it sideways. The easy thing to do to be a, right, every corporation to pay 20% tax or 15%, whatever the tax rates are, 25, it should be a lot more, but whatever. But they're not even doing that. So we may have to get it from them a different way, and this might be one of the ways. This is what I think. This is not. A, this is not according to the article. This is just my own opinion. So I'll read this. This quick paragraph. So trade unionists for a new and united Ireland <coughs> has welcomed the announcement of a pilot project to explore the feasibility of a four-day working week. The pilot project has been spearheaded by the four-day week of Ireland campaign, which Forza and the ICTU are members. The trade unionist of a new and united Ireland spokesperson, Sean McElhenney, called for a four-day working week to form a part of the discussion on a new united Ireland. He said, The debate on constitutional change should be an opportunity to fundamentally transform Irish society in the interests of working people. In the document, United Ireland, Uniting Workers, we call for a four-day working week in a United Ireland. Ireland has some of the longest working hours in Europe, not to mention the soul-destroying commute suffered by many workers as a result of our underfunded and disjointed transport infrastructure and lack of regional development. The pandemic has shown that alternative ways of working are possible, but we need to make sure these benefits are felt by all workers across all sectors of the economy. As we advocate in our Unite in Ireland, Unite in Workers document, a citizens' assembly should be established. I think we need more citizens' assemblies. That's another thing as well. I'm going to put that in my my other thing, in my uh, my UBI pod. Um, A citizens' assembly should be to establish a plan for Irish unity. Part of these discussions should include how a four-day working week can be implemented across the private and public sectors without a loss of pay easily. It's a four day work it's a four day week. Sorry, if a four day week is to be sustainable, it means tackling low pay and precarious employment. The trade union movement should ensure the case for this is made 
by any at any citizens' assembly, inc- including discussing constitutional change. Mr. McElhenney concluded, we need to make sure that the people have decent incomes and the time to pursue hobbies, activism, community development and indeed spend more time with their friends and families. In a new and united Ireland, everyone should be able to work to live, not live to work, as is currently the case. End. Bravo. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely could not agree more. More of that sort of stuff. So, and that's the... That's the thing, uh, when it when it when it comes to, as it's called, a new and united Ireland. These are the conversations that we need to have, because quite clearly, Stormont aren't going to have them. So we need more citizens' assemblies. I think citizens' assemblies should be compulsory as a part of our government or way of government, because, as far as I'm concerned, the people can do better than most of the politicians. Look at the planet. It's currently on fire. I can't watch a nature documentary on TV at the moment. I just can't fucking do it. My brother told me the other day there was a new um, David Attenborough uh, thing. And he's just, he's an old man. He's going to die soon. He's very elderly. And he's just saying, listen, I'm I'm, I'm going to be gone. And this planet is basically fucked. And he was nearly crying. And I said, I can't watch that. That depresses me. I've been hearing this stuff from the night. From my, I remember my first awareness. I lit, I remember this. My first awareness of ecological impending doom was in 1989. I remember exactly where it was. And Radio 1, BBC Radio 1, had a, a, a Friends of Friends of uh, World Wildlife Federation Friend, and they were describing the destruction going on in the Brazilian rainforest. That was in 1989. I remember it. And I was horrified. And I phoned in and I gave money over. And it was it was unbelievable. It's been going on ever since and hasn't changed. In fact, I would go so far as to say it's gotten worse. Citizens' assemblies wouldn't do that. Is my point. Right? If people were in charge... That wouldn't happen. The wing nuts up in Stormont that believe in the young earth creationists and through their Christian fundamentalism, not just Stormont, elsewhere, that w- that the earth was put here for us to pillage and do with as we please. They wouldn't use the word pillage, but I would. The Citizens' Assembly doesn't do that. That guy on the Citizens' Assembly is outnumbered. I believe. But anyway, so there we go. So we're going to start talking more about the positives of a united Ireland. I don't want to just keep talking about the fucking clown car that is the DUP with its square wheels and big fucking clown shoes. I don't want to keep doing that, but I hope they take a break for a while and I can bring you some positive stuff. Right, so... Whew! That's the DUP done. I'm going to move on to the last bit, the culture bit. See what happens. See, this is why... This is so shit because I'm sitting here. This is called politics, culture, and some other shit. And all I did was talk about politics and did very, nothing on culture. And now I'm over the air and I'm going to go blast through the culture bit. And and that's not right. Not right, I tell you. So culturally, what's going on with me? And what should I suggest to you? Okay. Two things real quick. The Bonneville's gig, boom, I told you last time and the time before that, it was the 31st of June. You can see quite clearly on the poster, it is not, it is the 31st of July. I was rather downbeat on whether this gig was going to happen because I thought it was happening the 31st of June. It's not, it's, so hopefully with another month in the pocket there to make this happen. And then before that, on this Saturday night coming, I'm going to be doing a live stream here from the studio. I'm going to do some Bonneville's tunes and some of my own solo tunes. And I've one or two new tunes that I've, you may never have heard before. You can see the date there was Saturday the 19th on that little flyer. I put that back to this Saturday. And it's Andy Bonneville live from St. Quarantine 5. So this is my fifth quarantine gig. Not that we're in quarantine, but if you've got a groovy cool name like that, why would you change it? So, there we go. 
And before this is it, I'm going to do. I'm going to recommend you a couple of records. I can't remember whether I did this last week or the week before, but I think I did. In my head, I did. Of this, I'm going to move my picture off the screen and allow the beautiful and amazing Nina Simone take the. There we go. Uh, see how to do this. There we go. So that record there. The best of Nina Simone. I picked that up when I was on tour in France. And it is a best of. It's really, really good. Um, I haven't listened. I bought, we were on tour. Oh, we were in France anyway. I can't remember the name of the festival that we were playing. It was really good. Very, very, quite a big one. And there was a record store and I picked this up. Picked it up for Janie. I really listened to it at the time when I got home and stuff. But just put it on there the other day. Oh my god. Oh my god. How fucking good is Nina Simone. Isn't it amazing how you forget? You haven't like you, you know that it's Nina Simone, right? So you know she's good. But you don't listen to her for a while and you forget. Then you put a record. Just oh, I think I'll listen to Nina Simone. <gasps> Jesus, I can play it three or four times, back to back, just straight through, flip the record, listen to it again. Really, I mean, one of the greatest ever. Get that record, or a Nina Simone record, and if if you can't, um, Spotify. There you go. So, in keeping with our, our sisters of the musical, or the musical sisterhood, this is a great album from friends of ours called you can see it in the screen there Mr. Airplane Man the Mr. Airplane Man is Margaret Margaret uh, Garrett and Tara McManus and they Mr. Airplane Man were doing the rounds back in the early noughties um, when the Black Diamond Heavies and uh all that Detroit, uh, the, the, those American bands were coming over here, and uh, the, the Alive Records and the Beast Records, and all those labels were sending bands across. And uh, not Beast Records, Beast, Beast Records are French or Spanish or something, but Estrus, that's what I'm thinking of, Estrus and labels like that. And all those bands were coming over here, and Mr. Airplane Man were kicking around with those at the time, and they they're fantastic. Now, and this is two piece, two girls. Um, bluesy, very bluesy, but unique. You've never heard blues like this. It's very gentle, very trippy, very riffy, very northern Mississippi. So it's got that signature of a of a a musical theme, like on a loop, repeated and licked through. But just oh, if you think that's easy to do, you're wrong. It's very difficult to do. So this is their last long player this is called Jack Around the Blue you may not get this this is hard to get but if you can get it get it I rec- couldn't recommend it anymore very chilled out very groovy and there you go so Mr. Airplane Man and Nina Simone doesn't get any better than that as far as I'm concerned so there we go we're all done there's no more messages on the no, no more messages on the live chat. So, if you have anything, if you have any messages, if you want to send me something, if you have an opinion, if you want to get involved and have me read something out, let me know. Um, audience is getting bigger every week, I'm keeping an eye on the numbers, um, which is cool. Please uh, like, share, subscribe, as it says here. There we are. There. There we go. Like, share, subscribe. We're on the YouTubes. We're on the Twitters. And we're on the Instagrams. I don't have an Instagrammy, but if I did, it would go in here. Um, do the whole thing. Uh, tell your friends. Join in every Wednesday, 7 o'clock, and the podcast will be going out as an audio uh, thing tomorrow. So there we go. All done. Cheery bye, everybody. Hope you have a good week.